recess. Uh, now it's the opportunity for the defense to proceed with their opening statement. Mr. Cordelli, you may proceed. Good afternoon. I feel a little bit like the teacher who gets stuck having the first class after lunch. I get to talk to you guys after you'll have lunch, so I'm going to try and hopefully be interesting. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be straight up with you. The evidence is going to show that on March 12, 2007, Ms. Claudia Hogan shot her husband, Carl Hogan, three times in their home in trouble. You can hear the she killed him. We believe the evidence, and the evidence will show that she killed him with the first shot to his back, that he tumbled down, and she shot him two more times. As we talked about and discussed in Vladimir, we believe the real issue in this case is why. Why did she shoot and kill her husband? As I said, the evidence will show on March 12, 2007, Mr. Howard returned home sometime between 9 and 10 in the morning. He'd been out of town a few days before flying for Southwest Airlines. You can hear that when he came home, his wife, Claudia, met him in the bedroom and advised him that she was pregnant and showed him a pregnancy test. Now, you hear from many couples, while this may be a moment of great joy and happiness, for the Howards, it was the direct opposite. You can hear from Mrs. Farrig that her husband told her, I don't care if you're pregnant, you're not having this baby, I don't want a child, to which you're going to hear say, why? Why don't you want the child? She's going to tell you this too. Herod told her, my 18-year-old daughter's pregnant, and I'm going to take her child and raise her child so that my daughter can go to college. You can hear Mrs. Herrig tell you that she told him that she would go ahead and move back to New York and have the child there. She was going to tell you that she told him, or he told her, that you don't understand. I don't want the child. And she's going to say, well, I will raise it and pay for it myself. And she's going to tell you that he told her, you don't understand. I don't want to have the child. I don't want you coming back in the future and getting child support. I and mean, I have to raise my grandchild. You're going to hear that Ms. Hillary told him that she wasn't going to have an abortion, she was going to have this child. And then Mr. Herrick told her, we'll finish this argument later, I want to go have a shower. He's going to tell you, the evidence will be that he went into the bedroom, she left, he went in and took a shower. You hear that he was in there about an hour. You hear during that time Ms. Hillary was visibly upset, anxious, you can hear from her that she found a bottle of alcohol they brought back from Brazil. You can hear she started drinking. You can hear evidence and see photographs from the crime scene that the house, empty bottle of alcohol was found in the house on the bed. You can hear from Mrs. Howard that she continued to think and be upset. <clears> Their <throat> mind wandered to the 357 that she had purchased just a few days before. You can hear from Mrs. Harrod that the 357 was sitting in the bedroom in the small closet you saw. You can hear and see photographs of the device that I'm going to call a suicide ring that she had built to hold the gun so that she could kill herself. And when you hear all that evidence, you'll hear evidence from her and her testimony and her recorded testimony that she decided the way to get Mr. Harrod to talk to her was to take the gun and stand outside the door so that when he opened the door to the bedroom, he saw her with the gun in his hand. You're going to hear that she did that in that small little landing that you stood on earlier today in that house. You're going to hear from her that there was indication she wanted to talk with him. They wanted to talk about this. You're going to hear that a small struggle ensued while he attempted to get the firearm from her. She fell down, at which point... He told her, that's a good idea. 
just do me a favor. Wait till I'm out of here. Go down to the basement and do it so you don't get blood all over my painting. You're going to see pictures of his paintings that he has. You hear Miss Herrick's statement. At that point, he's walking down that very small little stairwell. That he's a couple of steps down the stairwell. That he has his shoes on, that they're untied. You hear from Mrs. Herrick. At that point, enraged, she stood up, fired the first shot, striking him in the back. You can hear her say that I knew that that shot killed him because he went limp. His leg buckled under him, and he stumbled down the last couple of steps, falling as he lay. His shoes came off. She says at that point that she thought she fired two more times at him. You can hear from the evidence that there were a total of five shots. The shot that killed him, and then three shots that were fired from about the same location based upon the trajectory, two of which missed and were on the floor. The third shot was into his back as well. You can hear that a final shot was taken and into the side of the head. You can hear that the evidence of the doctor, Dr. Flora, you can hear his evidence, his statement, that as the state said on opening, as they discussed, the shot that he, right up here close, that they said is prior calculation to that. You can hear from their doctor, their expert, that Carl Harvard was already dead. But that shot is post mortem. <clears throat> he was dead at the time of that shot. You heard from the state that shot the first, the shot to the back, the non fatal shot, laid him out. And incapacitated. And you can hear from their own expert that that shot was not incapacitated. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what you are going to hear as the evidence of what happened that caused the death of Mr. Carl, Mr. Carl Hart. Going back to the why, we need to start back with the beginning of the relationship. In about May of 2005, Ms. Claudia Harris, living in New York City in an apartment that she owns. She has a good job as an accountant. She's independent. She's living. Everything's going great. You can hear from her that she goes on Match.com. One of the people that contacts her on Match.com is a dashing Air Force pilot by the name of Carl Horvath. You can hear that they start talking. You can hear from <coughs> Mrs. Horvath. One of the first things she wonders is why is this gentleman from Trumbull County, from Newton Falls, talking to me. I live in New York City. We're far away. You can hear her tell you that he said, I have the ability to move around and be different places. I'll come to New York. You can hear that he tells her, in fact, I'll be there tomorrow. And you can hear from Mrs. Howard, true to his word, the very next day he shows up on her door. You can hear in her own words that he was this dashing, airline pilot in tight-fitting leather pants at her door just as she promised. You can hear that over the next couple of weeks, approximately three weeks, the two of them talk on the phone. They meet in person. Twice she comes to Ohio, he comes to New York. You can hear from her, she paid for both of those trips. You know, after just those three short weeks, she comes out to Ohio to visit with Carl and a bunch of other people, and they go up to put in bed. Unbeknownst to her, it's an engagement party that Carl has set out an engagement party for them. She didn't know that that was happening. You can hear from her that at that point she's thinking to herself, I'm 40, I've just met this amazing pilot, he's good looking, he's nice, I may never have another chance. I'm not screwing this up. So she goes with it. And you're going to hear three weeks later, they're in Las Vegas on June 30th of 2005 getting married. The evidence will show that soon after that, she leaves her job in New York, packs up her stuff, rents her apartment to somebody else who moves out to Newton Falls, Ohio. You're going to hear that soon after she moves out to Newton Falls, Ohio, Carl signs up and takes a three-month training course in Texas, leaving Claudia alone, by herself, unemployed, in a home, in a city and a state she's never been in. She's also going to tell you at that time, unbeknownst to her, again, his 16-year-old son was going to be living there. 
we hear from Ms. Harris. We spent about the next three months taking care of his kid, paying bills, in his house with him going. So you're gonna hear she said it was a rocky start to their marriage. It's a bad way to start. You hear from Mrs. Harris that however things got better, she found a job as an accountant in Ohio. She lived in Newton Falls. They slowly began to work and get things better between the two of them. You can hear from her that his schedule was difficult. He's gone three days at a time, flying, back for a day. But they're working on it. Things are going well. And then you can hear from her the unexpected happened. She became pregnant for the first time. You can hear from her that when she and Carl first started dating and getting together, she didn't think she could get pregnant. But lo and behold, you can hear from her she did. And you can hear from her this was the first time Carl expressed for her that he didn't want children. He wanted no part of children and he wanted to get her an abortion. You can hear from Miss Harris she didn't want that, didn't like that idea, um, and that she had a miscarriage. You can hear sometime later a uh, second unexpected pregnancy with the same results of miscarriage. You can hear at this point the marriage is difficult and on the rocks. Uh, they all know it only lasted two years. And they're trying to make it work. You can hear from Ms. Herrick that after the second miscarriage, she started to suffer anxiety and depression. All she had at that point was her job. She has a husband flying in and out of town. No real friends in the area. You can hear that that goes on for a while until we reach kind of a tipping point. in February of 2007. You can hear all the parties realize marriage was not good, things were not going well. They were discussing separation. And you can hear that on February 7, 2007, just a little over a month before Carl's death, Claudia Eric took the entire bottle of sleeping pills, Calls people in New York, told them she'd taken poison, told Carl she'd taken poison, gotten her Nissan Altima, and drove off to drive off the road to kill herself. You can hear there was a 911 call subsequently. Ms. Harris is involved in an accident, drives into a pole, is taken to the hospital, and subsequently admitted to St. Joseph's Medical Center on a psychiatric hold where she spent the next eight days because she's a danger to herself. You can hear Carl comes and sees her at various times. You can hear that one of the things that's discussed in that is that Claudia had just recently attempted suicide by trying to shoot herself. So you can hear Carl decided he better lock up and hide the firearms. You can hear eventually she's released after her eight day stay and goes back to the house. You can hear because of the issues she's had and the issues Happen, she loses her job. So now we're at the end of May. Claudia's home, suffering from anxiety and depression in the mental state where she's attempted suicide. And she's home alone because Carl has decided to resume flying. He's flying in and out of town. You can hear that beginning in early March, Claudia starts to decide she's going to kill herself again. You can hear that on March 10, 2007. She's decided she's going to try and do it again. You can hear from her that she researched all sorts of ways to kill yourself, all tied about the best way to kill yourself, and decided that shooting yourself was the best option. You can hear that on March 10, she goes to the bank, takes out the majority of her money, her money, separate bank accounts. Neither person's bank accounts overlap. 100% her money, $9,900 and wires it to her father in Brazil. You can hear her tell her, I wired in the $9,900 because I wanted my family to have it in Brazil because I was going to kill myself. You hear that she goes to Slug Masters and starts asking questions about guns and firearms and ends up buying a 357 Magnum, in part based upon the advice she got. You can hear that she goes to the Warren shooting range, practice her shot shooting. She knew both of these locations from her husband, Carl. These were places that 
he had actually taken her. Um, she goes there and is shooting, and the individual there you can hear tells her that she really doesn't want a 347 or 357. She wants 45. It's, it's better for all the purposes. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll hear the evidence that she filled out. You'll see she filled out all the paperwork, all set to buy the 45, except she's got no money in the account because she and sent $9,900 to her family. So she says to the individual, I'm going to come back Monday and buy this. Monday afternoon, I'm going to come back and buy this 45. After that, she goes, she's going to hear to Gander Mountain, where she buys 357 Magnum and 45 caliber ammunition. She goes home, and then you can hear about the night of the 11th, that on March 11th, the night before her husband died, She's home alone on her computer searching 357 and suicide. Gun suicides. Gun deaths. For hours. You begin to hear about the what I call the suicide rig. It's a block of wood that she had made, drilled a hole in, cut holes, measured, had a chair, and the idea was she would, you'll hear from her be able to sit in the chair and pull the trigger and the gun, because it was fixed in the back of wood, wouldn't recoil upward, causing her to miss a target. I told you what happened on the morning of the 12th already. So, we're back to the 12th. Mr. Herrig is dead. Mrs. Herrig is shot and killed. When you hear from her at that point, she attempts to kill herself, thinking she's got two bullets left in her gun, but she doesn't. You can see from the records and from her testimony that at that point she calls Brazil. Calls Brazil and talks to her family. You can hear from her the family talks her out of killing herself. And the family gives her the advice, she'll tell you, to leave Ohio. She'll tell you they told her Ohio is the death penalty. You need to get out of there. So what the evidence will show is after a series of calls to Brazil, she covers Mr. Herrig up. She walks out to the car. Actually, no, right there. She covers Mr. Herrig. She goes back to her computer, and she does a bunch of internet searches on flights from the US to Brazil. First time she's searched those in a long time. Figures out when the flights are, what's going on. Here she goes out, gets in the car, drives to the bank, goes to the safety deposit box, picks up her passport, Drives to, drives to the airport in Pittsburgh. You can hear that on the way to the airport, she calls a friend of hers in New York and says, hey, I gotta catch a flight to Brazil today. Can you give me a ride from JFK to LaGuardia? He says, no, I can't do the time. You can hear that she gets to the airport in Pittsburgh, uses her husband's Southwest privileges to get on the plane from Pittsburgh to New York. Gets on the plane from Pittsburgh to New York. Subsequently uses the remaining money she has to get to the airport and to buy the ticket for Brazil. Sits around and flies to Brazil. What you're not going to see, or you're not going to have evidence of, is any planned flight. You can hear that she left behind almost a thousand items of personal clothing, 70 pairs of shoes, dresses, clothing, boxes and boxes of clothing. You're going to hear that she was so polite that she actually took the, the gun that she had and put it back where it started in the suicide rig and left with the, the bullets there. Made no effort to hide. That was the gun or anything else. And she fled to Brazil. You can hear that she was arrested and extradited in accordance with the law. Put on a plane. Flown back to Ohio on the plane voluntarily. Told the marshals her story. Came back here, sat down. You're gonna hear, you're gonna watch. She sat down with the detectives. You're gonna watch. She spends a half an hour or so. You're gonna see in the video telling them she really doesn't want to talk about what happened. She doesn't want to give them all the information because she doesn't want to hurt Carl's family. She doesn't want to impugn the dead man. Before finally she talks for about three and a half hours. You're going to hear throughout that scene, 
Marshall Bolden repeatedly to say, well, yeah, that's exactly what you told us on the phone. I mean, well, that's the evidence you're going to hear. As Miss, as Herod told you herself, as she will say herself on the thing, Carl Herod is dead because she shot him. And she shot him because at her moment of weakness, 30 days after she's attempted suicide, when she wants to have a conversation with him, he tells her, go ahead, kill yourself. Just do it in the basement so you don't get my stuff messy. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the evidence you hear. That's why the why is so important in this case. You won't hear any evidence of premeditation, planning,